Well, this is part two of the episode, Changing the Paradigm of Men's Ministry. And when we talk about paradigm shifting, we are talking about an important change that happens when the unusual way of thinking about um, doing something is replaced by something new in a different way. And that's what we're talking about today when we're talking about ministering to men. I'm your host, Mike Sound, and thank you for joining us on this Intentional Conversations. In part one of Changing the Paradigm Men's Ministry, we discussed the importance of having a vibrant and effective men's ministry and that men's ministry is more than a pancake breakfast and putting your hands and feet to work for God. This is part of ministering to men, but men's ministry is much more. And we discussed that if a church desires to have a life-changing movement in the community, they need to intentionally target the men encouraging them to be in a discipling relationship. In this episode, Kevin Gregory of Man in the Mirror is back with me, and we're going to continue our discussion talking about ministering to men. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks for being back with me on this program. Thanks, Mike, for having me. It's good to be back. I look forward to uh, sharing some more of what we've been talking about. Hey, Amen. You know, it's, it, it was a good conversation we were having, and I hated that we had to cut it off because of the fact of our time, but it's something that uh, we, we mentioned. And we're not joking, but folks, when you, those of you listening, we're not joking. When we talk about Kevin and I can, can sit around a table and talk about this all day long, we really can't, but we can't. <laughs> so Because we got, we got to get out there and engage with you guys and talk to you guys and so forth. But we talked a lot, a lot about ministering to men and, and how a church can really uh, – change their whole idea, their whole philosophy of uh, reaching out and capturing the men's hearts. I know that uh, usually at this time I give a little bio of Kevin. I'm going to forgo that this time because Kevin is, like I said, was recently on. Uh, if you didn't hear that part one, I encourage you to go back because it will set you up for what we're going to talk about today. And uh, But Kevin is an area director for Man in the Mirror. I will tell you that he's located in Sanford, North Carolina. Uh, and he's been with them for about what seven, eight years now. Seven years, yep. Seven yeah, years. Seven, just seven years. Just, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I'm not sure if we said it the last time, but what? How big of an area do you typically cover that you will physically go to somebody and talk? How big is, is it? All of North well, Carolina, or just a portion? <laughs> Right now, it's all of North Carolina because we're trying to get recruits in other areas of North Carolina. But but um, for the most part, we're supposed to stick within about a, a thousand church uh, area. Uh, uh -huh. I'm in the heart of, heart of North Carolina, so I'm supposed to kind of capture the heart. But right now, I'm coast to coast to mountains and yeah, uh, Virginia, yeah, Virginia to South Carolina at the moment. So. Uh yeah, up there where you're at, a thousand churches are not that. It's not that big of a radius. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> and down here where I'm at in 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 Wilmington, North Carolina, Wilmington used to be known as the the uh, city of steeples you know, because there were so many steeples in Wilmington. So it's the same way. Well, Kevin, let's talk a little bit about kind of refresh people's minds of what we were talking about last time. We were talking about the the no man left behind model to help them to understand the importance of what to do to begin to develop their men's ministry to be an effective and, and ministry towards their men. And we, and we were building that foundation. Could you quickly give us those, those three steps basically, or those three foundation pillars, so to speak, that, that they have to have before they can really get the ball rolling, so to speak. Yes. And gladly, Mike, we, we talked about laying the foundation of discipleship as, as the base um, if the church does not adhere to the mandate of scripture to go you therefore make disciples of all nations, that's really the the, the base or the what we call the portal priority uh, being discipleship, discipling men. Uh, that's the base. The second step or the second base of that foundation, of course, is creating an environment where men feel welcome to the church. Uh, whatever that environment looks like, uh, it may have to do with the physical layout or the physical environment of the church. It may have to do with uh, just the uh, the uh, atmosphere of men feeling welcome in an environment. Um, if there's a lot of women, a lot of children, and there's not many men in attendance, then then that in general is a put off to some guys because you know there's there's more going out for men, women, and children than there is for men, um, and so men don't often feel friendly in those environments. So the second base, of course, is how do we create an atmosphere, an environment where men feel uh, welcome. And then the third one, of course, is the, the leadership. Um, is the leadership 
uh, designed specifically to reach out to men. Are they, does the pastor have a vision right. for it? He's the lead. He's the guy that has to have a vision for what he wants to see men doing. And then he has to have a key guy uh, that comes alongside of him to help him to fulfill that vision, whatever that is. Uh, that key guy doesn't have to necessarily be the one all to lead all, but he has to have at least a passion to see men uh, doing life on life discipleship. And then of course they need a team. They can't do it by themselves. They need a team of guys with every skill set uh, to reach all of the different types of guys that will be coming or, or are a part of their ministry uh, to the men in the community. And so those are the three bases we talked about. Yeah, they're they're solid, and you need to have them solid. Let me ask you a question. I'm gonna th I'm gonna throw you a curveball here. I'm gonna okay. ask you a question here. It was, it, it was actually asked of me this morning when I was meeting with somebody, um, a pastoral type person, and uh, and I was kind of shocked that he asked me this, but it's it's kind of kind of important. I want to hear your thoughts on it. He asked me, "Do you think for me, for us, I shouldn't say me, for pastors, for church, to have a a, an effective ministry to men that the pastor has to be actively involved in it? Uh, to be quite honest, I would say yes. And it goes back to one of the things I've been trying uh, to teach uh, building an effective men's uh, ministry is deals with a pastor. And let me see if I can pull it up here real quick, because it's, it's essential. I think that the pastor, um, has an idea of, of what he wants uh, for his men. And if he wants certain things for his men to be, then he has to exemplify that. Um, one of the things I talk about in, in for pastors when I'm talking about how you build a winning team pastor is you have to prepare yourself. And you the first part of that is to be what you want your leaders to become. So um, if, if, if you're not where you want to be, then get yourself trained, search out a mentor for yourself, uh, or other leaders that you can, you know, come alongside to learn from and then learn to lead by example. Um, if you want the the people of your church to be disciple makers, then you have to be a disciple maker of yourself. Now, I've seen it where churches can do this and the pastor doesn't have to do that. Um, if they're big enough and they've got, you know, they're really hands off to their next set of leadership and that next set of leadership can take it and run with it. Um, there are some big churches that can do that, and they can do it very effectively. Uh, but I'm just saying, for the most part, the, the average church in general, if the pastor exemplifies what he wants to see in his body, it is a lot easier, a lot more successful than if he doesn't. Um, Amen. And so that's, that's, that's the issue. Um, yep. So. Yep, and I agree. I totally agree, and that's kind of what what I, what I said to the individual too. It's pretty much the same same situation, and it's very important for a pastor to be engaged. He needs to be talking about it, and he needs to be from the platform, and 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 just in general, he needs to be talking about it. And uh, if you uh, if you don't talk about it, if they don't see the excitement in the pastor of of, of ministering to men, discipling men, then it's going to be very it's going to be a hard road to to hold. Now, this, we said that all of that, and you kind of summed it up. That don't mean you still can't do this. This is some. This is right. a model, cause, and, and maybe your pastor will catch the vision when they see his men getting into this. So, so you men out there who may feel a little, a little frustrated or discouraged uh, with your with your leadership in this, and your pastoral leadership in this area, because you don't think he's giving you the attention that uh, men's ministry need. Don't let that deter you. Keep moving, keep moving forward. God will, God will honor you, and you'll never know because these guys. I'm and, tell you Mike, something. And, and Mike, if you don't mind, I'll address that men's mystery leaders because I think sure. it's important too uh, for them to know. Just because your pastor's not on board, just because he doesn't have a vision, you can have a vision within that church of what you want to see men become uh, whole, whole in Christ and and maturing in their faith. And so you can be that example. You can be what you want those guys around you to become. You can get trained. You can sure to search out mentors and other leaders to gather around you, and you can learn to lead by example. You don't need your pastor. If Amen. he's not the guy, Amen. if he's not the one that's into building relationships and you are, take that bull by the horns and run Absolutely. with it because that's Absolutely. a mandate in Scripture to everybody. It's not just the pastors. It's to every man can follow the mandate of scripture into that mission. 
Absolutely. And I, and I appreciate you really reiterating that because this is something that I think is very important, very vital, because we know that when men get it, everybody in the church wins. And uh, and we really want, want to get that. And, you know, I've had a lot of conversations over the last several weeks, various individuals in ministering to men, even even professors and at, uh, at uh, some of our seminaries. In fact, I had one this past weekend with one. And he was just really sharing his heart about how many of our pastors, smart guys, knows how to to uh, speak the word of God into their congregation and expository preaching and really understands how to help them to understand the Bible. But a lot of them themselves has never had an intentional discipler in their life. And so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, this time, you know, we need to understand that a lot of our pastors are really in the same boat their their congregants in when it comes to discipling you know, is to understand that process. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate you uh, kind of kind of talking about that a little bit. Well, we left off after we talked about the foundation that there's a next step that you need to. We talked about it's kind of a, like a looking at it as a conveyor belt and mm -hmm. uh, uh, sitting on top of this foundation of having those three strands of leadership, of having that understanding of what your purpose is of discipling. And then, of course, uh, 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 moving on and in, in developing where the surveyor belt can continue rolling with the motor that, it, that that's that it's uh, that's driving it. So what is what is those three points that we need to kind of start thinking about once we establish our foundation? Well, again, it goes back, you know, you have to have an engine that drives something. I mean, mm -hmm. um, most pastors will say it's their calendar. Most pastors will say, you know, what is it that gives you teaching series? You know, some say it's from the Holy Spirit, all those kinds of things. And those are all really good things. <clears throat> but you have to have something in place that's that's driving you towards a mark, towards a goal, whether whatever it is. And we call this the Create, Capture, Sustain engine. Now it goes around, the, the hub of this engine is, of course, the pastor's vision. What what does he want to see? And it could be, you know, if we're talking men's and women's discipleship, we can talk men's ministry, you can talk about children's ministry, you can put anything here into this to this engine. But the, the, the bottom line is, is what is the vision? What is it that you want to see happen as a result of this of this engine? moving this conveyor belt down. What is the end product that we want to see at the end of this? Right. And for, for guys, for the men that we're targeting, we want to see them doing life on life discipleship. We want to see them become fully devoted followers of Christ and making disciples of others to become fully devoted followers of Christ. So the engine is a, a cyclic thing that we keep them going. So we create an opportunity for them to, uh, you know, get trained in whatever that is. We we capture that momentum by, you know, four to six week study or something. We take them deeper into the sustain piece where we're trying to sustain that change over time or we plug them back into the cogs so where they're involved in the next creating and capturing event, whatever it is. And then we continue that process over and over and over until we move them into maturity. We keep moving them into maturity. And if you look at Jesus, he, the, he modeled this with his disciples. He created an opportunity. The crowds gathered. He had the, the, the disciples all there. He drew the, you know, the crowd in. He, he talked to the crowd and then he pulled aside, uh, capturing those that stayed in, you know, somewhere around hundred and some people that, that stayed. He captured momentum with those folks and he talked about it a little bit deeper. And then of course, ultimately he gets to the sustain phase where he's he's taking these folks deeper. The 12 of course go deeper and then the three beyond that. I mean, he continues to create and capture and sustain in these environments. And then he does things like, you know, creates an opportunity for disciples to go out two by two. They go out, he brings them back, he captures that, you know, whatever their lessons were that they learned. And he sustains that change and says, okay, now you need to do this next time, or you need to do this uh, a different way this time, whatever. Uh, he, he talks about each time afterwards, there's like a little AAR, and then he, and he calls them deeper into a deeper relationship and then sends them out and to do something even more than they did the last time. 
we need to do that same cycle in the church. We need to create these opportunities for growth. We need to capture that momentum into more deeper understanding. And then we need to sustain that over time, either by plugging these guys into something more or making them a part of the next cycle or whatever it is so that they start to grow in their faith and, and, and then ultimately come mature. And then once they're mature, they also make in turn more disciples. Yeah. That's pretty much the cog. Yeah, that's a, that's kind of a good ten thousand foot elevation of understanding what that's all about. But you know, you're talking about a lot of times when you look at that model too. You're talking about uh, your 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 funnel that you're bringing these guys into is wide. Yep, it, you, want to, as, you want to grab as many guys as you can in this thing, yep. and then you want to take them deep. You want to take yep. you know you have wide, and then you turn it to where it goes deep when they're coming out the other side. So let's let's break each one of those: create, capture, sustain. Let's break them down a little bit if, if we can. When we talk about create, what are we talking about? What 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 is a create momentum? What is a well? Let's just, let's, let's just break down. First of all, we've got to identify what's our target. <laughs> That's true. That's what very are we true. For? What yeah. are we shooting for? Because each engine is going to maybe shoot for a different target. Okay, mm -hmm. so what's your target? So you've got the natural guy out there who doesn't know the Lord. He may be on the fringes of your ministry somewhere, like I was talking about in the last segment. You got the, the postman, you've got the FedEx guy, you got the janitor, maybe, or you know, the maintenance person or whatever. They're on the fringes of your church. They're the natural guy. <clears throat> what can you do to create an opportunity for them to plug in, in some way and then carry them deeper? Maybe it's an opportunity where they can come with a family and say, Hey, we have a family fun day on this year. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Harvest Fall Festival, whatever it happens to be, you target the natural guy to get them into an environment where you can build relationships to draw them in, to learn, you know, to learn about Christ, to have an opportunity to encounter Christ through somebody's story or through a testimony. And then you draw them into the next thing. Okay, so the next thing may be they come to your fall festival. You say, hey, would you like to be you know, involved in our Sunday worship? We do this on Sundays or we have a Sunday school or we have small groups. Whatever you think might be the next step for that natural guy to move and start that process. So you got the natural you, guy. You just, you, just, you just said something there, too, that I, I, I kind of want our listening audience to, to pick up on if they didn't hear that. When we talk a lot of times about men's ministry, men typically think, or the churches typically think of like a pancake breakfast or, or men's outing or something like that. But you said fall festival. And that's not generally a men's activity. So... So how how's that work? I mean, uh, you got you got men that are coming because they're bringing their families. You got right. guys that are involved in that. You may even have vendors that are dropping stuff off your church. What yeah. about the vendor that brings your uh, your bounce houses and all those other things that come in? That guy is a part of your ministry, and because he is now experiencing the church for the first time, he is dropping his supplies off for you to do your fall harvest. What are you doing to capture that guy? What are you doing to give him a right next step uh, to 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 have an introduction to Christ maybe for the first time, to have an introduction to your church maybe for the first time? What are you doing to reach that that man and his family or whatever uh, to bring them to the next step? So you talk. So so if I was a men's ministry leader and I was on a leadership team, when I'm looking at a create situation. I don't necessarily have to look at doing things that's just for men to find men that I need to target at. I mean, we got churches have things like um, dads that are in youth groups, you know, yeah. dads, dads whose children are, are involved in their youth groups for children. But you got things like VBS, vacation Bible schools, uh, and free you schools. You got you brought up two two great points, <laughs> Mike. You probably got a dad that not only drops his kid off, but he may sit in the parking lot in his car waiting for his kid to be picked up. He he may, in fact, you know, you know, he doesn't have any place to go, and it's maybe an hour or whatever, and so he just hangs out there, um, you know, on the fringes. If you don't have anything going, that's a perfect example of how you can reach out to that person and find him the right next step. Perfect example. Um, you got daycare. I mean, if you have, a, if you're running a daycare, you got dads that are dropping their kids off at of daycare. We live in a time now where moms are making the income in a lot of these families, and dads are the stay-at-home dads. Uh, yeah. You have a perfect opportunity as a church right there 
to bring a guy in that you can just do. I have a church in Lake Norman that just picked up on this and did this. They had a daycare situation. And what they did is they captured those guys and said, hey, how would you learn, like to learn five things that will make you a better father? They didn't say wow. anything about <laughs> Christianity. They said, how, how would you like to learn five things that will make you a better father? And they got him involved in a small group learning these five things. And they targeted the guys that were dropping their kids off at daycare. There are so many ways and so many opportunities that a church has in their ministry of what they're already doing to capture guys. It's just to be creative, be imaginative, uh, think outside the box um, and start targeting these guys and to ask yourself, what is the right next step for this natural guy to get him to on this road to spiritual maturity? What is, or to encounter Christ for the first time? What are some opportunities that we can get involved to build relationships with these guys, to get to know them, to hear their story and be able to share God's story? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so many things where we, you know, when we begin to open up and we start thinking outside that box, we start thinking, start thinking uh, outside that Saturday morning breakfast or, or that uh, wheelchair ramp where we want to get guys together to build or or yard cleanup. All of those in, are part of it are included, but we want to go beyond that in our thinking when we want to capture and, and sustain or capture uh, capture men and and, and uh, be able to re uh, reach them to their souls and be able to minister to them. Well, we're going to take a break right here, Kevin, and uh, and for for a minute. And uh, folks, uh, we're talking with Kevin Kevin Gregory of Man in the Mirror, and we're talking about the the three items that every men's ministry needs to have after they build their foundation of their leadership and understanding their purpose of why their men's ministry exists. So we'll be back in a moment. God bless you. We'll be here in a second. You're listening to Intentional Conversations with Mike Salen. Thank you for taking the time to listen to these podcasts. If you're interested in knowing more about me and what I have learned over the years working with men, check out my book, The Call, A Journey into Men's Ministry. You can find the book on Amazon.com or on BarnesandNoble.com. Check out the website, CapeFearMen.net. You will find many recommended resources to help you and the men in your church grow in Christ. You can also follow my blog and discover events Cape Fear Men will be hosting throughout the year. You can even schedule a time to talk with me about your men's ministry or developing a mentoring relationship. If you enjoy these programs, I would ask you to do two things. One, share this program with your friend. And two, consider helping to keep these broadcasts coming to you by giving to Cape Fear Men. You can give by going to capefearmen.net and click on the Give to Cape Fear Men button at the top of the page. Thank you in advance for your donation. Now, back to the program with this week's guests. Okay, welcome back to Intentional Conversations with Mike Salen. We got Kevin Gregory here with us from Man in the Mirror, an area director up in Sanford, North Carolina. We've been talking about creating that vibrant men's ministry so you can reach every man in your church or in your community, actually reaching out beyond the church walls. And uh, we just got through talking about creating situations and creating uh, opportunities, momentum to reach out and, and capture men. Now let's talk about that a little bit, Kevin. Let's, let's move to that capture phase. When we talk about capture, what do we, what do we, looking at what are we looking for and what, what do we need to be doing there well we're looking for the right next step for that natural man i mean that's who we were talking about there's there's the four types of guys there's a natural guy there's a cultural christian who knows it's good to be in church he may know that you know it you know church was something in his history and it, he wants his family involved in that so he comes to church he knows it's good to give uh, to the church. He knows it's to be involved, but he really doesn't have that personal relationship with Christ. So that's a cultural guy. Then you have the biblical guy who has a relationship with Christ, but he doesn't know what to do with it. I mean, he, he's he's been born again. He's he's baptized. He's a believer. Um, he's actively involved in whatever's going on in the church, but he he's not on that road to spiritual maturity, uh, knowing how to deal with issues biblically in his life that he's going to face, knowing how to, to become ultimately a disciple maker. And then, of course, you have the leaders, uh, in the church who are now mature. They should be making disciples. That's where they should be. Uh, that's where we want to be. So 
every, in every one of these uh, types of guys, you want to be able to uh, create an opportunity for them to go deeper, to be mature. Um, so whatever that event or however you want to capture them, whatever the right next step is for them, you know, for the guy that's a cultural guy, he, he doesn't really have a relationship with the Lord, maybe. So maybe you need to do a couple of studies or a book study or something that's real simple that would introduce him to a deeper faith, a deeper faith walk, and maybe he'll take that step. Um, there's tons of resources. We have resources at Man in the Mirror. We do books by the box. That's a good intro uh, way. We, most of those books are uh, four to six week studies that you can get guys in in that cultural Christian thing to take the next step with a small group of guys to study a book and, and read a chapter and, and then talk about it. Uh, and then it will help them to develop, you know, a little bit more deeper relationship with Christ and maybe ultimately come to believe and trust him as their Lord and Savior. The biblical guys, you want to do something a little bit more in, in depth with them. Um, maybe there's some things that they know that they need, that they need, you know, experiencing God, maybe the next step or or um, something on that, you know, living the Christian man or, or doing uh, any of those types of things that take them into a deeper walk uh, in their faith uh, that will ultimately lead them to become disciple makers and leaders in your church. So each one of those types of guys, you need to think in your mind as, as, a, as a pastor, as a team leader, as a team, how can we capture these guys as we do our church calendar, as we do our events and our activities? How can we, can we capture these guys and help them to go deeper in their walk? How do we plug them into small groups? How do we plug them into be doing life on life in relationship with other guys? And then how do we create opportunities for them to get educated and trained uh, so that they become uh, fully devoted followers of Christ first, abide in him, and then are able to disciple others as well. You know, and you brought brought up a point when you're talking about the five different guys we have in church uh, uh, today. And, uh, and you know, we're talking about the lost guy. We're talking about the cultural Christian. We're talking about the biblical Christian. We're talking about your leaders. And then we're talking about um, uh, those guys that are hurting, who is in all four of those other spectrums, those five different guys. And so uh, how important do you think it is? You you know you have those kinds of guys, but you don't know how they're broken up. You know, how many of each or if one's more than the other and so forth. How important it is to get to know your guys and how can I get to know them? It goes back to, again, are we creating opportunities for guys to get to know each other? Are, are we creating an environment in the church that says um, this is a place that guys can hang out and literally talk? You know, or can do fun activities, can go to a football game, can go golfing, can go, you know, do life and just have fun. Uh, but they can also get to know each other and build relationships where they can then talk about issues that they're facing that they need biblical answers to. Um, or, you know, or, you know, they, they come to realize, hey, I need more spiritual maturity in this area. What do I do and how do, or who, where do I go to get it and who's going to help me? Um, if you don't create the environments or the opportunities for them to do this, to build relationships and to uh, build community so that they can go deeper in small groups and one-on-one -on -one relationships, that's what it's all about. We have to, we have to create the community for them to be able to um, have these discussions that you're talking about. Yeah. You know, you hear pros and cons of surveys. You know, some people like them, some people don't. Some people think they're effective. Some people don't think they're effective. What is what is your take on surveys and doing surveys to help get we, to know we, your guys? We do surveys all the time. I mean, it's, it's sometimes the only way that, you know, because we live in a society of anonymity when it comes to intentional things. <laughs> I, right. I mean, I say right. that in a way because guys, yeah. you know, they're afraid to be called out on – on certain things. And so uh, the survey is a, an opportunity for them to have an anonymity, but at, at the same time have input. So we do surveys all the time because it's a good way to get some honest feedback about, you know, what's going right, what's not going right. Um, and then what can we do better? Those kinds of things. Um, we work with churches all the time to do that. We ask pastors right up front to give us an intake survey. How many guys do you think in your church are, in each of those categories that we just identified. 
How many guys are in each of those categories? How many? First of all, we ask them, how many do you think you're ministering to in general, just in total? Your total population, yeah. man, what does that look like? How many of those have a, you would say, a biblical uh, perspective? And how many of those would you say are in a discipleship relationship? How many of you would say they're involved in your church? You know, they're active in doing whatever activities in your church. How many guys are active? And you'd be surprised. Pastors know exactly how many guys are doing what in their church. It's not that hard to get a survey to get an idea of what their baseline is. And what we're seeing is after working with churches who adapt our, this model of No Man Left Behind, and they really get behind it, we're seeing within two and a half years a 48% increase in just the number of men that attend that church and an 84% increase in the number of guys that are doing life-on-life -life discipleship. And that's wow. huge. I mean, that's yeah. huge. And yeah, surveys are important. Um, how important are they? I'll give you an example. I did a, a barbecue uh, not too long ago uh, with a church uh, out in the western part of North Carolina. Uh, they had 69 guys in attention, attendance. And I, I told the pastor up front, I said, the format is great. But I said, I can guarantee you just from me looking at it <clears throat> you, that you need to get some feedback. What went right? What, what could we improve on? Just put that on the bottom line and then and then leave him some other options uh, to answer questions. Well, he put it all in the survey. You would be surprised the, the number one thing. One of the things that, that he was surprised at was he had this presentation that he gave him some table time. The number one uh, thing that came back for most of the surveys was they did not get enough time during the table time discussions to talk about. Uh, the issues that they brought up in that conference. So that is, guys, that is, that is important. That is important. Guys desire to hear from other guys on life issues, and they want to talk about those things. And so that was huge. Um, so surveys, for, to me, are important because they, they allow guys with an, an, a little bit of an anonymity to be able to respond honestly as to what they're thinking and feeling. Let me ask you this, and I don't want to belabor the point because we've got to move into another area, but, on, but but to kind of finalize on surveys, how long should that survey be? You're talking about five questions, six questions, ten questions? Uh, two or three questions at the most. It doesn't take much. I mean, if you if you have more than five questions, you're going to lose your, your, their attention. <laughs> I mean, yeah, seriously, I, it doesn't I take agree. much to have. I mean, a simple short survey that takes five minutes or less to fill out, and you'll let, get, let the, get it. Let sick. the guys have a – be able to check stuff off, let them check yep. stuff off. Now, it's not to say not give them something to write in, but but um, most guys will do it quicker if they if they could, all they had to do is check stuff off. So good, yeah. I'm a, I'm all for surveys too, but I know that some people have a uh, don't see the need of them. But if they use them right and they ask the right questions, it provides you a ton of information uh, yep. of, of how to reach your men. All right, we created the we created the momentum. We've seen we we've seen and figured out guys that we need to reach out to, the ones that are connected to the church in some form or fashion. We have basically created some uh, ways to capture them, dealing with possibly uh, stuff that's going on in their lives or where they are in their life right now, like if they're being their fathers or grandfathers or um, married, divorced, whatever the case may be. And now we want to sustain that momentum. So what are we talking about that when we say sustain that momentum? When, what you want in the sustaining piece is you want them to be in an ongoing relationship with a Paul, Barnabas, and a Timothy. I mean, that's the bottom line. So they need, they need spiritual mentors that they're meeting with regularly that can help them to deal with the issues that they're going to face in life. You want them to be in a band of brothers, a small group somewhere, um, you know, so that they have guys that they can reach out to um, and the 2 a.m. friends, those kinds of things. Not only that they can, you know, um, you know, share about things that they're dealing with, but also to just do life with. They got to be able to have fun and, and play and and, you know, just enjoy each other's company. Uh, from 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 just a just a, a good standpoint in that regard, a good healthy what does a good healthy uh, man on man relationship look like, um, and and that's the kind of environment. And then the deeper one is, every man you want to become a disciple maker, so they need to take under their wing the next generation in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's they lead a small group or they they you know they they learn to lead a small group or they become a assistant small group leader until they get trained up or whatever. It's an 
It's where you start to pour into them, uh, to turn them and move them from just being, you know, the cultural or biblical Christian into the next step. And once they start to get to that next step, you want everybody to become a leader of some sort eventually. And you want everybody to be able to mentor a Timothy in some way, shape or form. So you're going to try to help them to plug back into those create opportunities as leaders. Now they're going to look intentionally in those environments to be able to come alongside somebody and so that they can work uh, to, to bring them into a small group environment and then eventually into the life on life relationship. And that's what you want to do. So that eventually now you've got, you're, you're training the next generation of leaders who's training the next generation, generation of leaders. And eventually the church is going to grow as a result. It's going to continue that momentum further and further. And you're going to end up with a lot more leaders, a lot more groups, a lot more guys doing life on life over a long period of time. Oh yeah. It's, it, that is so important. You know, I don't think, uh, you know, one of the things the church has failed uh, over the many years, and I'm not saying in the last few years because it's been in, it's been kind of kind of a, a culture of the church for centuries, and, and and that is not having those life on life uh, relationships that we need, and we didn't see that when G when Jesus Jesus modeled that. I mean, he pure say modeled that when he pulled those twelve guys uh, into his inner circle. And uh, and just poured his life. He yeah, he talked to thousands of people, but there was only twelve okay. guys right. that he really poured his life into. Yeah, and uh, and then eleven of them went and and changed the world, yep. changed the world. And so we we need to understand that importance of doing life on life and uh, with with each other. Uh, that's that's great stuff. That is, that is super stuff and. And what are some examples that you may have seen? You don't necessarily call out churches, but uh, maybe you can say church A, church B, or something like that, uh, if you don't want to use their names. But what are some examples you've seen where this has really been effective in a, in a church? Well, the when a church gets to the point where they can actually transition leadership to the next generation, mm -hmm. I feel like that's that's a success church to me. I mean, the first generation of leadership – it, it, it's always iffy as to whether the guys can hand off or not hand off at the end of their of their um, cycle, whatever that happens to be. <clears throat> and so the churches, and I, you know, I, I've got a couple now that have now done two and three iterations of leadership handoff. And to me, that's exciting because now we've got these guys, and it's not that they're not being involved anymore after they hand out the leadership. They're actually going and capturing another whole set of guys. <clears throat> but the next set of leadership is actually leading the church in the mission to reach more guys. And they've, they've successfully handed it off. In fact, some a lot of the senior leaders of the original group are now totally uh, developing life-on-life -life relationships uh, with individuals and they're meeting, you know, hours each week, you know, with four or five different guys. And that's when I feel like we've gotten to success is because now you've got a, a senior leader who's taken under his wing four or five Timothys. And that's all he's doing all week long. He's, he's pouring his life into those Timothys who are carrying on the next set of um, missions in church. And the other thing I like about some of these guys is they still have their own small group. The original group that they start with, they're still meeting. And it's now, you know, fast forward 20 years later, and they these guys have now grown up with each other. They're now growing old together and they're enjoying each other's company. They're doing life together. But every last one in that group has got four or five Timothys. And that's, that's when that's, we yeah. can see success. Yeah, uh, that is that is spot on. That 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 just uh, encourages me so much to to hear churches are doing that. You know, I, uh, I'm not a young guy anymore, <laughs> and uh, though I think and sometimes I I go out there and track like try to act like a young guy, and I, and I pay for it the next day. <laughs> but you know, one of the things I talk to uh, people in my generation in the winter years of life, so to speak, is that um, uh, you may have, you. Don't ever think of retiring from the church. Never think about retiring from the church. And I, I hear I hear people who have retired from their careers. They're in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And they say, it's time for the younger guys 
to take up the mantle and lead the church. And, and they're right to some point, but you don't need to go back and, and sit in your lazy boy and watch sports all day. You still have a ministry to do. And I talk to them about it a lot because you can see that teaching in the word of God uh, that that will not do that. And, and the interesting thing is, and I was talking to someone this week about it, is if you go to Numbers chapter 8 and look at um, uh, 23 through uh, 26, and, and I won't necessarily talk about the, the whole thing, but but it says, in starting in 24, it says that this applies to the Levites. Talking about retirement, this applies to the Levites. Men 25 years old or more shall come to take part in the work of the tent and meeting. So they're talking about the staff of the young guys to step up and do the work that needs to be done in the church, so to speak. And then it says in 25, but at age 50, they must retire from their regular service and work no longer. Now, the key is we stop right there a lot of times and say, we don't have to do anything else. You know, it's young guys take over. That's not what the word says, because you got to keep reading. Verse 26 says, they may assist their brothers in performing their duties at the tent of the meeting, but they themselves must not do the work. This then is how you are to assign the responsibilities of the Levites. So in other words, what they're saying is, yeah, you're not doing the hands-on work. You're not getting out there and, and, and getting dirty, so to speak, but you're teaching these guys how to do it. So yep. you're, you're continuing to minister to them. You're discipling them in, in, in the work. And, and that don't stop until yep. God takes you away from this planet. He takes it, yep. takes you home. And that's what we got to, we got to help a lot of our men who, especially our older men, that's near and dear to my heart, help them to understand, you know, uh, you've got a lot of head knowledge up there, not only from, uh, not only from uh, life experience, but also from biblical studies that you've done through all, all your life. You need to be sharing that your experience into these young men and helping them out. And even if it's not, you know, I mean, I hear a lot of guys say, well, I, you know, all I have is family. I don't have whatever. I said, yeah, well, that's family. Family is huge. you got sons oh, yeah. and you got grandsons and you got great grandsons. Oh, yeah. That need that need to be your Timothy's, if nothing else. Oh, I mean, absolutely. If, just, if you don't even move outside your family, you've got that. That's a requirement to the day you die. And they need to see you live that out to the end of your day, whatever that is. And the next yeah. thing is, is for those that don't have all, any of that, it goes back to the same thing you're saying here in Numbers, but it's also addressed in Titus. Find guys, faithful, available, teachable guys, even into their end stage, their late stage, that will take somebody under their wing uh, to help them to grow in their faith. Um, and, and, and I'm telling you right now, this generation that's coming up, Generation Z, and of course we're going to, I'm, I'm going to be addressing this at Iron Sharpens Iron. I hate to be a plug in here, but we, we that's coming up here. And uh, we need, we need, I'm going to be addressing this, but the bottom line is the Generation Z that's coming up, that generation supposedly is going to be the least, the least religious generation in the history of the United States. Think about oh, that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, yeah, can't, yeah. we can't afford as godly men in the church to sit on our laurels at the ages of 60 to hundred, whatever it is, and not do something. And we need to be about uh, putting these guys under our wings intentionally, uh, helping them to become disciple makers. Yeah, I was at a conference this past weekend. and was talking to somebody and they were sharing with me uh, a 93-year-old man who went home to, to be with the Lord. And even at age 93, he was still discipling uh, young men and, and well, and, and of course, at ninety three, a sixty year old young man to him. But anyway, he was he was still he was still discipling men. Period. He was discipling men, and he was in the process. The guy told me he said he was in the process. He had five guys under him as his as his Timothy that he was sharing um, with and, and ministering to, and he knew that his days were coming to an end. And he called him and said, "Hey, I'm not going to be able to finish to go go through the with these guys." Um, before the Lord takes me home. The Lord's called me home. I know my days are few, and I'm not going to be able to finish with these guys before we can release them to go, uh, for them to go disciple. Would you take up the mantle for me and finish discipling? That's how, to me, that's just amazing to me <laughs> that somebody is so into it that they even think about these young guys before they cross over into eternity uh, with the Father. And, and that's the mindset that, 
we all need to have. You know, yeah. When you yeah. think about it. Well, I said at the beginning of the program to our listeners, you and I can continue talking about this all day long, but we're coming up on our time and we're going to have to start wrapping this up. So uh, for your listening, for our listening audience out here, I would encourage you to go back and look at part one of what our discussion of, uh, of, of changing in paradigm in your men's ministry and uh, and then listen to part two. We'll all fold together and work together then with you. And of course, you can reach out to either one of us uh, to to uh, for more information. Uh, Kevin, how can I get up with you again? It's Kevin Gregory at org. That's my email. And they also can go check out the website, org, and they can find me in the area directors, under area directors there as well. Yeah, and I, I would encourage you to do that. And you can reach me at mike.sandlin at kfearmen.net or go to kfearmen.net website and look at it. Well, Kevin, I want to give you a couple of minutes right here uh, before we close out of just uh, sharing whatever is on your heart about why it's important for us to uh, speak into the lives of men. And it's yours for the next minute or two. Well, a good example, when we talk about the hurting guy, I've been helping some uh, – veterans this last week or so i've been working with a couple of veterans to try to get them through to some services that they they need and then uh, found out sadly on friday night that uh, uh, a family a military family that i've been working with as a church planner uh her husband committed suicide just mm. military guy that um was dealing with struggling through life issues. He did not have anybody. He was not involved in a small group, was not involved in a church. And uh, to me, that's, I mean, I take those things personally. I don't know about you, Mike, but when it's in my sphere of influence that, that a man has passed and I do not know the status of where he is in sp his spiritual walk, and I know that he's struggling in life and that, that, that there were resources and things that we could do to help reach that person, uh, that hits me hard. And so I, you know, hit hard. And so what I'm trying to tell every man out there is there is somebody in your sphere of influence that needs to see Jesus. And you're the only Bible that they're going to read. And I want to know, are you a good translation of the Bible for that person? And it is important for you to grow spiritually so that you can be a good translation to those around you because you are the only Jesus that those men will ever see. And you need to be able to share your story of how God's worked in your life so that he can work in their life to make a difference. Thank you, Kevin. That, that, that is spot on. That is good stuff. That's a good word there. Well, folks, I, I appreciate you taking the time and listening to us today. I want to just want to remind you, if you want to reach out to Kevin, you can go to Kevin Gregory at maninamira.org. Or you can go to the website of maninamira.org and look him up that way by under area directors. And I thank you, Kevin, for being with us, uh, being with me. I think we got about almost two hours worth of good information here for people uh, uh, between part one and part two to really be able to digest. And I hope that they will reach out to you and uh, know that you and other area directors are doing No Man Left Behind trainings where you really dive deep into all that we discuss. We just scratch the surface of what, uh, what, uh, what, what we're talking about here. And I, and I hope they will do that. And, uh, uh, I know there's a number of no man left behinds going on throughout the year. And I encourage you to go out onto the man on the mirror website to look for those because, uh, you may be listening to this podcast a few weeks from now. We won't mention what's coming up in the next couple of weeks, but, but they're out there. So go out there and check them out. And I appreciate it. Kevin. Thanks again for being with me. Thanks for having me, Mike. You have a great day. Yeah. And for our listening audience, I appreciate you listening to us on Intentional Conversation with Mike Sandlin. And uh, I hope to hear or see, I should say, I hope you will listen to us. I'll get it right in a minute. I'm getting tongue tied here. It's been a long day. But I, I hope you will listen to us again on the next Intentional Conversations with Mike Sandlin. God bless you. And we'll talk to you later. Thank you for listening to Intentional Conversations with Mike Sandlin. Intentional Conversations is a production of Cape Fear Men, a men's ministry coalition. Cape Fear Men is a 501c3 organization operating under Ministry Alliance. To learn more about Cape Fear Men and how Cape Fear Men can help you reach the men of your church, or if you want to know more about what we discuss with these programs, go to capefearmen.net. 
If you'd like to speak to me directly, email me at mike.sandlin at kfearmen.net. But for now, I will leave you with this blessing. I pray God will give you a rock to stand on, a brook to drink from, and a tree to shade you. This is Mike Sandlin saying God bless, and I hope you will join me again on the next Intentional Conversation with Mike Sandlin.